Hey, what's up guys? Today I'll show you a horror film, Necronomicon, Book of Dead. Spoiler ahead, watch out and take care. The movie begins in the fall of 1932. A famed author who specializes in the stories of the macabre had discovered that the Necronomicon, otherwise known as the Book of the Dead, is currently in New York under the protection of a group of monks. The book contains the secrets of the universe, and the author is resolved to get his hands on it. The author visits the building where the monk's collection is located. He has often visited that library to do research for his previous books. He pretends that he's there on another research trip, but he really wants to find where the monks are keeping the Necronomicon. The head monk browses through the shelves to find the encyclopedia the author requested. While he's not looking, the author grabs his keys from his belt. The head monk leaves him alone, and the author goes off to explore in the forbidden sections of the library. However, he doesn't notice that a dark-skinned monk has seen him prowling around. The author uses the keys to get into the forbidden section. Inside that room is a locked vault. The problem is that he does not have any idea how to open the vault. A moment later, the gate swings shut behind him, and the vault opens on its own, as if it has been waiting for him. The author retrieves the ornate leather-bound book inside. On the cover are engravings of hellish creatures. The book crackles to life in his hands. He doesn't notice that the vault also lights up. The author brings the book back to his table and opens it. The pages are filled with slow handwriting, and he eagerly takes note of their contents. Right then, the seal inside the vault opens. The author pens the first story from the Necronomicon. The story takes place a few decades into the future, and starts with a man arriving at a remote seaside hotel. He had discovered that he is the long-lost heir to the rundown hotel, after his uncle had died years ago. The heir has now come to reclaim the hotel and restore it to its former glory. The lawyer with him explains that the hotel has been featured in many horror stories swirling around in the nearby village. They hear the roar of waves coming from underneath the hotel, and the lawyer adds that there's a network of sea caves under. The two go up to the master bedroom, where a once elegant canopied bed is rotting. Hanging on the wall is a portrait of a beautiful dark-haired woman. The lawyer tells the heir that it is his aunt, the former owner's wife. She died after drowning in a shipwreck. His uncle became desolate with grief and jumped to his death from his bedroom balcony a few days after. The heir looks out the same balcony himself and sees the sheer cliffs directly under the balcony. This makes him think of his own tragedy. He was driving the car and his wife was with him when they got into an accident. He survived and she didn't. Before the lawyer leaves, she hands him a letter from his uncle that came with the last will and testament. The heir sits by the fireplace and begins reading the letter's contents. His uncle had written it right before he killed himself. He recounted that the trouble began when he was returning home after a long voyage at sea. His ship was thrown into the rocks near the coast, and the uncle barely made it out alive. When he woke up, he found out that when the ship crashed to the shore, it had killed his wife and son, who were waiting for him to come home. That night, a creature from the sea visited the uncle. He gave him the Necronomicon and left without another word. Inside, he found a ritual to resurrect his dead wife and son. The uncle performed the spell by drawing a pentagram on the floor and cutting his hand. He recited an incantation while his blood dripped down on a bowl. The floorboards underneath the pentagram started glowing green, then his wife and son woke up as if they were never dead. But when they stepped closer, the uncle realized that they were resurrected as monsters with glowing green eyes and GPS tentacles sprouting from their mouths. The uncle could not stomach the horrors he had unleashed on the world, so he decided to kill himself. The heir could no longer read the rest of the letter as the words had faded over time. He desperately tries to find the book inside the house, but has no luck. That night, as the heir sleeps inside the master bedroom, he hears his uncle whispering to him that his beloved cursed the book. The heir wakes up and gets the idea to search for the wife's portrait. He removes it from the wall and finds the book hidden behind it. The heir is not fazed by the remorse felt by his uncle. He is so racked by the loss of his own wife, Clara, that he decides to do the spell as well, hoping to bring her back. Right then, Clara arrives at the hotel covered in seaweed and her hair long and wild. She slowly walks toward the air as he profusely apologizes for his hand in the accident that killed her. Clara is pale and cold, and when she bends to kiss the air's chest, there is foam coming out of her mouth. Just like his uncle's story, an octopus emerges from her mouth next. To his horror, he realizes that there is a long fish appendage jutting from her back. The air defends himself and slices Clara. She falls downstairs to the foyer and screams in pain. She turns into a slug and slinks out of the hotel. The air hears the rumblings of a massive sea monster in the caves underneath. The monster breaks through the floor, its humongous mouth yawning open to consume the air. Air climbs up the big chandelier, and Clara emerges again to try and yank him down. But he shakes her off and accidentally breaks the glass ceiling. 
Clara recoils from the sunlight hitting her skin. The air finally manages to kick the chandelier, causing it to embed itself into the sea monster's skin. Injured, it retreats back into the deep. The air climbs up to the roof and welcomes the sunrise. Back at the library, the author finishes the first story. He stands up and walks around, clumsily dropping the key into the subway grate below. He notices that the seal is open in the vault, but continues to absorb the book's contents. He then embarks on his second story. This story is also set in the future. In the middle of a punishing heat wave in Boston, a reporter investigates the mystery of several murder cases around the city. He visits an apartment where a woman of interest leaves. He tells her that he is investigating the series of murders over the decades that happened in the neighborhood. The woman lets him in, and the first thing he notices is that the apartment is very cold. The woman explains that she has a rare disease where she cannot stand heat or sunlight. This explains why the woman is wearing sunglasses and a cardigan in the hot weather. An unseen old lady that the woman calls mother hands the woman some tea to serve to the reporter. He tells her that according to the records he dug up, the apartment was owned by a doctor 80 years ago. There is no official record of his death, and he simply disappeared. The woman denies having any knowledge of what happened to the doctor. The reporter issues an ultimatum. Either the woman tells him the whole story, or he writes his article as is and implicates her. The woman turns toward the window and tells the story of her mother, Emily, who came to Boston 22 years ago to study the flute. She had rented a room in the apartment owned by the doctor. Emily looked a lot like her daughter, having the same brown hair and facial structure. The landlady ushered her inside and warned her never to disturb the tenant living on the third floor. The tenant was a mysterious doctor. That night, Emily stepped out of the shower and into her room. When she looked up, she saw that an ammonia-like liquid is dripping from her ceiling, presumably from the doctor's apartment above. Her stepfather popped out, having climbed inside through her open window. He had long been abusive toward her in many ways, and Emily fled her childhood home to get away from him. She ran out of the room and slammed the door on his wrist. The stepfather caught up to her as she was walking up the stairs. Suddenly, the doctor emerged from his room and stabbed the stepfather with a scalpel. Surprised, he fell down the stairs and died. When she woke up, the doctor had already bandaged her head wound. He explained that he has a rare skin condition, or that he can't tolerate the sun or the heat. The doctor also prescribed some pills for Emily to take. Emily woke up for the second time that night. She saw blood dripping from the same spot in the ceiling. She went upstairs to investigate, and saw the doctor and the landlady doing a medical procedure on her stepfather's body. The doctor was holding a drill and boring holes in the stepfather's spine, while the landlady prevented his still-alive body from shaking too much. She lost consciousness and collapsed on the floor. When Emily woke up, the doctor told her that she was hallucinating as a side effect of her medication. The doctor cut himself with a scalpel, and the same ammonia-like fluid burst out of the wound instead of blood. However, Emily didn't notice this. The next day, she got a job as a waitress in the diner across the street. When she mentioned that she is living with the doctor, the owner is surprised that the doctor is still alive, since he must be more than a century old now. Emily just thought that the owner was joking and thought no more of what he said. When she served a group of cops in the diner, she noticed a missing poster for her stepfather. She immediately went home and confronted the doctor about what really happened to her stepfather. He confessed to her that even if her stepfather had survived his fall, he would have killed him for what he did to Emily. In the middle of all this, the doctor began to collapse and yelled that he needed ice. Emily helped him to his apartment and laid him naked inside his cryogenic pad. She collected ice and covered his body with them. Gradually, his condition improved. The doctor finally told her the whole story. He had gotten a hold of the Necronomicon and discovered the secret to attaining immortality. The ammonia-like fluid that Emily kept seeing was actually a spinal fluid that the doctor injected into himself, so his body could be preserved that way. As long as he is kept out of the heat and the sun, he will live forever. Enthralled, Emily slept with the doctor that night. The landlady, who was obsessed with the doctor, was distraught. She told Emily that if she can't kill for the doctor, then she cannot be what the doctor needs. Emily realized that the landlady and the doctor were killing people and extracting their spinal fluid, so the doctor could live forever. Terrified by her discovery, she fled the apartment. However, months later, Emily found out that she was pregnant. She returned to the apartment to inform the doctor. But when she stepped inside the doctor's room, she saw him and the landlady trying to extract spinal fluid from the diner owner. The owner kicked the doctor to the floor. While Emily tried to help the owner, the landlady stabbed him in the back. She then tried to convince the doctor to kill Emily because she knew too much. The doctor furiously told her no and accidentally pushed all the equipment off the table, including the container with the spinal fluid. The fluid also burst into flames, exposing the doctor to heat. He sequestered himself in his bedroom, but already he was starting to melt like a candle. 
He quickly told her that with no spinal fluid to inject into his body, he will die. The landlady returned to the room holding a shotgun. As the doctor's body melted into nothing, she shot Emily. The landlady was about to deliver a final blow when Emily revealed that she's pregnant with the doctor's child. Still madly in love with the doctor, the landlady spared Emily's life because of his child in her womb. Back to the story, the woman sitting in front of the reporter reveals that she's exactly the child of Emily and the doctor. But the reporter doesn't believe her smelly bullshit, because there had been three more deaths after the doctor had died. He thinks that Emily is still killing people for their spinal fluid, so she can live longer just like the doctor. But then the woman calmly removes her sunglasses, proving that indeed she is Emily. She tells the reporter that after sleeping with the doctor, she got infected with the same medical condition. The baby in her stomach was never born, and Emily just kept injecting herself with spinal fluid, so she could keep feeling the fetus kick. The landlady helped her murder people, so they could keep the baby alive. The reporter realizes that the tea Emily served him was drugged. He collapses to the floor as the older landlady approaches him with a syringe. Back at the library, another seal opens. The author starts the third and final story. In a crime-ridden Philadelphia, two cops are pursuing through a highway a suspect called the Butcher. While on the chase, the cops Paul and Sarah are arguing about their one-night stand, which results in her being pregnant. The chase comes to an end when their car slams into the other vehicle and flips over. When Sarah wakes up, she sees an unknown person driving Paul's unconscious body out of the car. She tries to follow them, but is too woozy from the accident to catch a glimpse of who the person was. Sarah also attempts to call for backup, but she gets no response, so she follows the blood trail inside an abandoned warehouse. The person continues to drive Paul to his service elevator, and they descend. Sarah trips on a rope, and she falls, suspended in midair, because the rope got tangled in her feet. When she gets on her feet, she meets a man who introduces himself as the landlord of the warehouse. He tells Sarah that he can help her catch the butcher, because he's renting the warehouse. The landlord leads her to the floor below. A blind woman pops out of the shadows and aims a shotgun at Sarah. Sarah confiscates the shotgun, and the landlord introduces the blind woman as his wife. In the landlord's office is the Necronomicon. He is busy clearing things out so they can enter another passageway, and the blind woman tells Sarah that she is not really the landlord's wife, and they just met on the street two weeks ago. Additionally, she also tells her that the butcher is an alien. The landlord leads them through a tunnel filled with ancient engravings. Suddenly, the blind woman rushes up to her and sets Sarah on fire. She falls down a hole and finds herself inside a dark cavern. There she sees Paul's corpse, his insides hollowed out like he's a husk. A giant monster bat swoops down and attacks Sarah. To her surprise, Paul's voice is coming from inside the monster bat. He explains that the monster took his brains because it needs them for breeding. Sarah looks around and sees smaller monster bats on the cavern walls. Sarah wakes up on an altar inside the cavern, with the landlord and the blind woman hovering over him. They are trying to feed her to the monster bats, so they can be immortal. It turns out they both are the butcher all along. The blind woman informs her that the monster likes bone marrow, and then they start hacking away at Sarah's limbs. Sarah wakes up once again, but this time she is in a hospital now. A woman who looks like the blind woman earlier is now her mother. The landlord is now a doctor. The mother pressures Sarah about her decision to abort the baby and reveals that Paul is brain dead. They whip back the curtains to the hospital bed next to hers, and she sees the hollowed out body of Paul from the cavern. Sarah screams and is now back at the altar. The couple have already taken her baby and her limbs. The monster bat is sucking on her bone marrow, and her blood drips down the altar. Back at the library, the author finally closes the book. The head monk catches him and reprimands him for disobeying. He tells the author to open the door, but the author confesses that he lost the keys. Suddenly, the sea monster from the first story emerges through the subway grate and clamps down on the author's feet, but he heals the monster, using his sword and his cane. Right then, the head monk reveals himself to be just another monster. The author kills him as well. The gate mysteriously opens, and the movie ends with the author fleeing into the night with the Necronomicon. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.